This morning I want to spend a bit of time looking at some antelope species, some of the common species that we confuse with one another. And I think the easiest way of doing that is let's have a look where they found for starters. Good morning everyone, welcome to another episode of Shimori TV, my name is Andrew. This morning I want to spend a bit of time looking at some antelope species, some of the common species that we confuse with one another, how to tell them apart, some interesting facts about them, what makes them unique, and I think the easiest way of doing that is let's have a look where they found for starters, and we'll kind of break them down into some categories. We'll look at the, the open grassland species, we'll look at the intermediate species, and then we'll look at the bush species. If we look at those three kind of like uh, areas, it'll help us differentiate amongst some of them. So I hope you enjoy the next little bit. As you can see next to me moving through the bush line over here, it's a beautiful herd of kudus. There's a big male bull kudu over here. You can see his characteristic twisted horns. This group over here is comprised of a number of females, this beautiful big bull over here, and then there's one or two youngsters in the bush line over here as well. Kudus are a, a very unique species of antelope. They are quite a large species of antelope. A good uh, a bull like this will weigh uh, over 200 kilograms. They're one of the, the largest, tallest antelope that we get. So I think an interesting thing about antelope species is half of the antelope that we see, males and females have horns, and the other half of the antelope species that we see an example is kudu, only the male has horns. A lot of it has to do with where the animal lives. Your kudu, for example, are antelope, and as we can see with these guys over here moving into thick bush now, horns can actually be a hindrance when they're trying to run through thick bush. The females and males, they rely on a form of protection where they freeze and they don't move at all when they hear or, or think of predators around. And literally, you can, you can sometimes get so close to kudu and they haven't moved, they, they just stand dead still and at the last second there's this explosion and they run away. And it's that surprise that startles the predator and they hopefully then get away. But if females had horns, it would be a hindrance for them moving through the bush. The males use the horns for fighting, for dominance and obviously to secure a higher position so that they're able to control a, a breeding herd of females or a group of females like you can see over here. I think a, a lot of where you find antelope has to do on its kind of uh, job description. And animals are all about limiting competition as much as possible and occupying a niche space that allows them to be as successful as possible. Kudu, for example, live in thick bush. Their diet comprises mainly of leaves, some twigs, a lot of seed pods, as much nutritional bush as possible. But they are uh, what we would call browsers. They feed off of leaves, bush and twigs. And that allows them to move through very thick bush. It allows them to utilize these acacias very successfully, needle bush, but it means that animal needs to be adapted to living in a, a bushy, thick environment. Its hearing has to be adapted to thick, bushy environment. His feet are adapted to living and moving around in, in, uh, in areas where he needs to change direction very quickly. For that reason, we're looking at an animal that occupies a specific niche, thick, bushy environments, and they're not very well suited or adapted to moving out into the open areas and feeding off of grasses. There's other antelope that have decided to do that and occupy that niche. So I think one of the reasons why we wanted to do the segment on antelope species was a little bit of the confusion around some of the species and how people can really misidentify animals so easily. And this is such a common example and it's actually quite nice to see them together. We've got a springbok over here and impala, a small little herd of impala. And obviously the comparative difference between the springbok and impala is so easy to see now. But when they're apart, some people do battle to tell them apart from one another. But if we just have a look quickly at the differences over there, we can see that springbok over there has got such a white underbelly, really, really extensive white underbelly from midsection all the way down. And then just on the midline, essentially, is a, a very dark brown 
and the further away you get from it, the darker it looks, almost like a black stripe on the side of it. The Impala we can see is much more of a fawny red color. In fact, its Afrikaans name is a rooibok, which means a, a red buck. It's got the fawny red color on the back, slightly lighter on the sides, and then it does have white underbelly, but a much smaller white underbelly compared to the Springbok. Impala a little bit bigger as well overall. If we look at the Impala, they were moving through this area, they'll feed on grass, they'll feed on tiny little forbs, they'll feed off of these little succulents over here, and they'll move all the way up into the side over there and feed off of the needle bush and the acacias. It's what we call a generalist. It's a browser and a grazer. That's why the Impala is so successful, is because they're generalists. They are edge species. They're found on the edge of woodlands and essentially where there's both mixed vegetation, grass and bushes. Not too thick and not too open, but it's allowed Impala to absolutely infiltrate everywhere. There's a beautiful group of kudu bulls up on the hillside here. I'm just going to move a little bit closer to them. It's so fantastic at Shamwari that within such a small area, we've got a thicket biome on the side over here, coming down to open grassland and woodland over here. We have springbok, impala and kudus within a 200 meter stretch of one another. You see with those kudus how they always, there's these long periods where they just absolutely freeze, they're dead still. And then the only thing that moves is their ears as they're trying to listen for any threats or predators around them. Characteristic white tail, all kudus. When they run, it's just natural instinct. As soon as they run, that tail curls up and there's that beautiful, beautiful white under underside of that tail. The same as every antelope species has a follow me signal, a, a, a way of uh, visually communicating with members of its own species so that they can follow it, youngsters can follow parents and they can get away from predators. Something that impala do is called uh, bomb shelling. They're not the fastest antelope, they don't jump the highest, they don't uh, run the fastest but something that is quite unique is uh, what we call bomb shelling where uh, if a predator surprises them the whole herd just literally explodes and they go into quite a fast running and then into a, a rocking starting motion uh, as a display so the springbok will do the pronking to advertise to a predator i'm fit i'm healthy don't bother going for me the game's up i've seen you where in parlor though you know they also have the markings on the back the three black lines down the back uh, that is a follow me sign to them so as we've come out into this open grass area over here, you can see we, uh, we've come across a beautiful big herd of springbok. And this is a a bachelor herd, this is all males. So we were talking about the impala and the kudu where the males have horns and the females don't. Springbok over here, males and females have horns. Although in this setup over here, this social structure over here is a uh, group of non-territorial males. There will be a hierarchy amongst these animals over here. Moving towards breeding seasons, they'll obviously uh, a lot more testosterone, they'll start fighting and wanting to control a territory. And as we saw with that other single male over there, he will be a territorial male. In this open area over here, it's a very, very large open area. There will be breeding herds of females with youngsters, particularly this time of the year, there will be a lot of babies around. Uh, they're feeding off of grass and there's one or two individuals over there that are feeding off of acacias. So it's also slightly adaptable, but their preference is for much more open areas. Uh, it's a gazelle-like antelope. They rely on speed and obviously displays to get away from predators. They pretty much avoid very dense woodland areas and areas with very high water content. Perfect areas out here, drier regions, grassy, open. They can see predators and they've got a variety of resources here that they can utilize. Again, an antelope species that's found very, very open areas. So a lot of the colors on the animal are very contrasting. It's those contrasting colors that help with visual communication with one another at long distances. The males utilize their horns for fighting. So the horns in, in all antelope species where males and females have horns, the males tend to be slightly shorter and thicker 
uh, they need to be more robust to uh, basically compensate for the, the rigors of fighting. It's another great example of an open grassland species. This is a blessbok. And you can see a beautiful, beautiful group of females out over here. And most of them have little newborn calves with them. We're in the calving season at the moment. There's a mass dropping of calves at the moment for multiple species. Obviously, the reason for that is the survival strategy where the species will try and flood the, the environment with so many youngsters that percentage of survival, the numbers will just increase. If the predators come and pick off a couple, there's still a whole bunch that will be able to survive. You can see the color of those youngsters it blends in so well with this browny, sandy areas. Those youngsters, they can lie flat and you actually just don't see them at all. So blessbok species over here, it's a, it's a grazer. It feeds off of grass, male and female have horns. And we can see this male over here, the horns are just so much thicker than the females out over there. Long, thin horns for the females. And that is a, that's a pure grazer. They only eat grass, they're only found in open areas. They're suited for open, wide environment. They don't like thick bush. They, don't, they won't survive in thick, thick, bushy environments. Just over there, there's a little blessbok calf, quite a new guy, and he's lying flat, flat, flat. And it's such a, a typical way that this species, and in, indeed their whole family, rely on that tawny color in the youngsters to actually just avoid predators. So that is quite special to see. There is a black springbok. So all of our springbok over here, a normal looking springbok. And that guy over there is uh, very, very dark. He's like almost completely chocolate brown. There's nothing wrong with him. He doesn't have a disease or anything like that. Essentially what happened is there's a recessive gene that controls the melanin levels. And this guy has an excessive amount of melanin. And he is indeed called a melanistic form. He's not a separate species, he's not different. He'll breed as a normal springbok. He will in turn pass on that gene, that recessive gene. Within our gene population on Shamwari, there is the recessive gene for melanistic springbok. And it's almost like, uh, it's like the lottery. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, that recessive gene then becomes visible and uh, dominant, and then you can see the colors come through. In this case, it's a, a melanistic form. It's, it's not diseased or anything like that, it's just a recessive gene and it is very rare in nature. There are people that have now taken these animals and they specifically breed them to create a much higher percentage of that uh, recessive gene to become visible. But out here, it's just, uh, we leave it to natural selection. So this is another species of antelope I really wanted to show you guys today. It's called the red heart beast. It's a mixed open area antelope species. So they're found in open areas or mixed woodland areas. They don't like completely open and they don't like very bushy areas. They are grazers, so feeding on grass predominantly. You can see all of these little youngsters in this little nursery herd. So another big breeding herd of females and all the youngsters getting born at the same time. And you can see that nice fawny color is actually a, a youngster there with an umbilical cord on, about a 30 centimeter long umbilical cord. So very, very new little babies all being born and very precocial youngsters. The mother will give birth and within a few minutes that antelope can stand up and within an hour it's able to keep up with the, with the rest of the herd. And within a day or two it's able to, to run at, uh, at a decent speed. So your red heart beast is related in the same family, the same tribe as a wildebeest, blessbok, bontebok, sesebi. They all form part of the, the same group of antelope. So within the, 
group like this, there will be a dominant male and then uh, the group of females, the territorial male will have all of these females. Uh, male and female have horns. But the female's horns are a lot longer but narrower than the males. The males, as with all antelope species, the horns are much more thick set. Well, I hope that uh, cleared up and debunked some of the, the common confusion surrounding some antelope and also showed you the diversity and, and differences amongst them. It really is quite phenomenal. So I hope you enjoyed that and hopefully we'll see you soon. Stay safe. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Kearney. I'm the Ranger Manager at Shamari Private Game Reserve. I just want to take a moment to say thank you very much for all the support and feedback that we've been getting on our brand new channel, Shamari TV. If you haven't followed us yet, Hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell. Stay tuned for our next episode, and I'll see you right here at Shamori Private Game Reserve.